Hi, David. How are you? Fine. Fine, Beto. Another day, another interview, right? Yeah. Another Sunday morning. We have our mics. We have coffee. Everything's fine. Sunday morning, like the Maru 5 song, actually. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> It's I was thinking song. about uh, th that one with uh, Sugar Ray, I, I think. That started... I no, it says every morning. Every morning. Na, 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 na. Okay. Actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're not singing today. Okay, don't worry. So, so David, uh, yeah. uh, another episode in English because we have a, a, a another guest from from far far away. Yeah. And, and this time, not that far, but it, it is from uh, northwest United States. Why don't you introduce her? Yeah, uh, we have with us uh, Erika Kobel. I hope I said right the second name, <laughs> but um, Erika, how are you? Hi, good morning. <laughs> good morning, good morning. How are you? Good. Fine. Enjoying my coffee. <laughs> me too. Cheers, me too. Cheers. Well, we all three have, have coffee. <laughs> oh, I have, I have iced coffee only because... It's a little. It's going to be a little bit hot today, but <laughs> it is perfect. So I, I think we 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 all needed this coffee to survive the the, the Sunday morning. Yes. <laughs> Actually, yeah, yeah. With my peanuts, uh, mug. I, I love, love it. it. Yeah. What it's kind cool. of coffee are you drinking? I, I'm so maybe Beto will get angry because I love coffee with milk. <laughs> so oh, me too. <laughs> It's fine. It's fine. I, I won't. I love it. Well, I I'm from Veracruz, Mexico, so um, uh, Veracruz has a very good production of coffee. So mm. the last the last Sunday I was there, so I bought uh, one kilogram from of coffee from Veracruz. So that's that's the blend here. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. For me, just just black coffee, straight just black, black coffee. coffee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wish I could drink straight black coffee, but for me, it's uh, I don't have the the the, the palate to to drink it. Yeah. I can um, only I have to have a lot of sugar and a lot of oh, milk. Yeah. That's the Cuban way. <laughs> yeah. Very <That's> sugary. <laughs> I, I used to be like a a a very I don't know like. That's why. That's why. Because th that's why David said I, I maybe uh, get angry because I was like thinking that coffee should be drink only black and that yeah. kind of stuff. But not now. I'm just getting a little relaxed with that. <laughs> <laughs> not I wish I could drink it. I think people who drink black coffee, there's a certain purity or or uh, yeah. style. You know, like it, it's it means you really enjoy coffee. You know, I feel like yeah. for me because I drink so much milk with my look at the color of this yeah. and cinnamon too. But and cinnamon, <laughs> and cinnamon. I love that's... cinnamon in my coffee, but that's not you know, that's an excuse to drink coffee because the cinnamon. I feel like no, just the sugar and the milk. Oh, it's okay, like an okay. excuse to drink coffee. You really enjoy coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, I, I love coffee. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's it's different. I feel like, but it's still, it's still uh, good. No matter how yeah. you drink it, it's still good. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Coffee is good, actually. Every day with coffee is it's a good day. Last yeah. day, I, I was watching a a, a an interview uh, in this podcast uh, of Joe Rogan, mm -hmm. and it was a guy. I don't remember his name. He was making a like an a a study about caffeine. Elon Musk? No, no, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I don't remember his name, but okay. So he dropped coffee, uh, uh, caffeine in, in any form for three months. Mm -hmm. And he was like suffering and it, it was the worst three months of his life, he said. Yeah. And then when he got uh, the first uh, cup of coffee after those uh, three months of zero caffeine in, in his diet, He said he was like almost hallucinating. He said it was like being high in in a way he haven't been in 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 his life. So it is crazy how 
it yeah, is a it, drug. It is crazy <laughs> how, how accepted this drug is. The caffeine mm -hmm. is in our lives, like, for so many reasons, historically, has been, like, introduced to the, to the working uh To the working people like the coffee breaks in, in when, when they were created it, it wasn't for you to to relax and take a break it was for you to take a cup uh, of coffee and then return and be more yeah, productive exactly. it is yeah. crazy so so it is a, a super different approach but okay we're talking uh, here about photography not <laughs> coffee but, but now i'm an I'm drinking in my peanuts I could, I could i could talk about coffee because coffee is such a big culture Yeah. And Cuban culture too, you know? Yeah. Like somebody always has to make in the, like you said, in the middle of the day, there's always somebody when you go to work at work who makes the Cuban coffee for the middle of the day. Like yeah. Who's going to make the cafecito, you know? And like cafecito yeah. is what keeps you going, you know? Because otherwise you won't make it. So, and coffee, actually, actually, sorry, the cafecito is like a, the, a little cup of coffee because it's yeah, so, so strong. It's so strong. So Cuban yeah. coffee is like just a little, like you'll make just this much and everybody drinks a little cup like this big. And it's yeah. very, very strong. It's just espresso, but with whipped sugar. I think it's the sugar that makes it strong because it's like, you know, now not only are you getting the high from the caffeine, you're also <laughs> getting the sugar. The sugar, sugar rush. High. <laughs> yeah. So that's probably why it's really strong but yeah it's such a big thing in our culture too so i mean and in seattle too now seattle yeah is the coffee city so i guess i mm. moved to the right place <laughs> yeah. yeah you did you did <laughs> you did well erica to start this conversation that's a good good topic to start off um can you tell us who is who is erica Cabell? and where are you from and i think that's that's the first question If you can yeah. answer it, please. Of course. Um, so I was born and raised in Miami, Florida. I'm first generation Cuban American. So my parents, my whole family is Cuban. Um, I lived in Miami up until I was 23 years old. I won't give away my my age just yet, but <laughs> I've been living here for eight years now and I moved to the Seattle, Seattle, Washington area. Um, I live actually like 40 minutes south of Seattle, technically. So I live close to Mount Rainier, which is like the really mm. big mountain here. Um, I actually live only an hour away from the mountain. So it's it's really beautiful. Nice. And yeah. I've been doing photography since 2008. So more than 10 years, which is kind of crazy to think about. I feel like 2008 was just like five years ago. I always think like 2008 <laughs> is only five years ago, <laughs> but it's actually so much more than that. So yeah. Yeah, and um, I've been shooting digital mostly up until maybe eight years ago um, was when I started shooting film. So I've been shooting film almost for the same time. I shot film in the high school and stuff like that, but never like took it seriously um, like how I do now. So, yeah. That makes Great. Erica, um, what led you to, to photography? When, when, did, when did you know photography was your path in this life or or how how do you describe that that decision that that moment so it's very funny i actually um my photography story journey has been um kind of interesting it's, ta it's taken different paths so the first time i got into photography was like when i was in elementary school i remember okay Um, we had like we were going to um, this place called Vizcaya in Miami. It's a really famous like mansion estate um, that has been converted to a museum. And I'll never forget. I had like this little Kodak point and shoot camera that took this very specific type of film um, that you can't even get anymore. They don't even make it anymore. APS, But it was, right? it didn't have like yeah exactly yep. And so that film, you know, I. I was using that for, you know, for middle school projects, sixth grade. And mm -hmm. I just loved it. I remember taking a photo of like this fountain with flowers and it was like a pan it was a panoramic camera back when like okay. panoramic was oh, starting yeah. to make a, a scene. So I took this picture and I was so proud of that photo. I'll never forget. And so after that, I felt like, oh, I really like to take photos. And I always liked 
some sort of artistry you know I liked drawing even though I wasn't very good at it um you know I just liked kind of exploring the arts in that sense I love music any so anything that was like artistically inclined you know like anything of the arts I really enjoyed and so my grandfather actually you know every time he would travel he would always have a camera with him and I just I loved that you know and I I didn't get to understand or appreciate why he did that until much later that I understood he's just capturing his life and documenting his memories. But um, once I got older, um, I wanted to kind of do the same. And I, I actually went to Japan in, when I was 18 years old. And when I went, I didn't take a camera. And I kind of hated <laughs> myself for it because I was like, it reminded me so much of my grandfather. Like, I, that's what I thought of. I was like, why didn't I bring a camera? Like, he would bring a camera mm, everywhere. Yeah. So why didn't I bring a camera for my first time to Japan, which I, I've always been obsessed with Japanese culture. And so I really was looking forward to that trip, but I didn't take a camera. But my friend that I was with, who came with me last minute, decided to go with me to Japan. She brought a camera and I actually ended up using it more than she did <laughs> on the trip. <laughs> So that was what was interesting is like, obviously I had a love for it and I really wanted to. So what's funny is most of the photos was like me taking photos and like me taking photos of her and like taking like cool, like reflective selfie photos, you know, with like mirrors and stuff like that all around the city. And yeah. so it was after that trip that I was like, I need to get a camera. <laughs> you know, I need to get a camera. I want, like, I enjoy taking photos, but I also want to be able to document if I travel. And um, and so after that, when I came back, I was like, okay, I want to get a camera. Yeah. Um, but I was 18, just out of high school, didn't have a job. And of course, yeah. I didn't want to get like a cheap little camera. No, no, I wanted a super expensive DSLR 5D Mark II, you know? So, <laughs> um so what's funny is it kind of comes back to my grandfather, but I went to my grandfather and I told him, will you help me buy a camera? Cause I was working, but like doing part-time work. Yeah. And so I was like, will you help me buy a camera? I have no credit, you know, just put it on a credit card and I will pay you back little by little. And I did. And so that's what I did. He bought me my first camera and then I started paying him little by little. And I'll never forget it when I handed him like an $1,100 check you know, to pay off a good chunk of it. He was so impressed that I was so young with so much like determination for the film yeah. or for the camera. I mean, that he was like, okay, you don't, you don't have to pay me anymore. So for me, it was almost like my grandfather kind of gifted me my first camera. Cause I really only ended up paying about half of what it was worth. Yeah. yeah. So, but he, you know, it was that love for photography. He knew I was serious about the camera because I was paying him. And then he also loved photography too. So he understood. And I think that that's ultimately why he did that. But it was after that, that then I really started to get into photography and just would take photos of anything. I had no style, no sense of what I liked to take photos of like portraits or street or, you know, mm -hmm. landscape. But from there on, it just took off because there you couldn't, you couldn't see me out without a camera in my hand. Yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> And it's a, a very nice story because you you kind of knew photography because of your of your your grandpa and and finally your first camera is is like in a, a process with him. It, it is great, a great story. Yeah. yeah also, I Japan actually, in the middle is also great. <laughs> I know. I have a photo that you know I always come back to from that trip in Japan. That for me was like when it hit me that I was like, wow, mm -hmm. I love taking photos. This is fun, you know? And it was like a guy in Shibuya Park with like this jug and he was like blowing into the jug and making music, like a, almost wow. like a, like a, um, what do you call like a, not like a, not like a mantra, but, you know, kind of like a hymn, you know, like a mm -hmm. meditative kind of mm -hmm. sound. And For me, like I was like, it was a really cool photo. And, and from then on, I was like hooked, you know, talking about going, you know, going back to this whole like caffeine is a drug photography started to feel that way <laughs> oh, too, you know, yeah. like it was a dick, yeah. started to get addictive. I wanted to take photos of everything, you know, so. Yeah. It is, it is addictive. Uh, 
don't even mention film photography yet, but photography itself. <laughs> that's why we we carry cameras all day with with yeah. with our phones every that's every cool. day every time. It, it is addictive, like having those memories imprinted in 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 in, in that that kind of of way of uh, I don't know visually is I think. I think it's the second uh, most important memories. I think the first one is the smell. Smell. Mm -hmm. uh, strongest but, too. Yeah, the strongest. And so uh, visually we are addicted to see what we like and to replicate it every time. Yeah, and that necessity to have a memory of everything right now is, yes. is, is I don't know, is that... It's the main thing to to be addicted to photography in this in this moment, and more with our cell phones and uh, smartphones and mm -hmm. social media. Actually, that's the the main thing. Uh, you have to have this visual diary every mm -hmm. day for you, only for you, because maybe only maybe people will uh, enter to your profile and will see some photos, but it, it, they have some some approach to that photos. Mm -hmm. The main reason is you and your approach to your own profile and your own photos because they are yours. So that's very, I, I think that's the main thing right now on social media. It's the necessity to have these memories always. You know, it's funny that you say that because for me, I feel like, I mean, I don't know how many people go through this and maybe maybe some people don't and that's that's great you know if you didn't go through it but I feel like when Instagram came out when Instagram became very popular and was very much around photography um I feel like I lost myself a little bit and right. I think that that definitely got you know had to do with the addictive portion of it um because it was a different type of addiction Um, so like when, it, you know, at first, like I said, when I first got my camera, I took it everywhere. I took photos of anything, a drink on the table, somebody's dog, somebody I'm sitting at a booth with at a restaurant. You know, I took pictures of anything and everything. I just was having fun of the actual process of taking photos. Mm -hmm. And then when Instagram took off, it was almost like it, it had a, it was great and bad at the same time, because I met a lot of great people and I started to really kind of kind of test myself or push myself in my boundaries of like what I wanted to photograph, where I would go. I would go to such lengths and extremes to, um, you know, go take a photo somewhere. Um, but then at some point I kind of lost what I was really passionate about, you know, and I found myself taking the types of photos that I thought people that would come to my profile would like to see. Yeah. And, You know, I feel like a lot of people went through that too. Maybe I'm alone. I don't know. But I, I definitely felt like... <laughs> no, <this> you're not. <laughs> I felt like this sense of like, I need to please people. I'm very much like a people pleaser type of personality. Like I mm -hmm. like to make people happy. And I think that that coupled with the desire to have my photography seen and shown and the addiction of taking photos, all of that together ultimately was you know a bad thing for me it was a hindrance because like I said I started taking photos of things I didn't really feel passionate about like for example when I moved to Seattle it's so easy to take a beautiful landscape photo and everybody who doesn't live here wants yeah. to see that they want to see mountains and lakes and you know sunsets and sun sunrises at these mountain tops and peaks and stuff like that and a lot of people desire that because of the lust for travel because of like you know with landscape photography it's very psychological people envision themselves there when they see that exactly. photo so a lot of people really react and they really kind of gravitate to that type of photography so for me i felt like that's what i need to take photos of to be liked for my work to be seen to be appreciated and it and it was that you know i got a lot of likes and followers when I first moved here because of that type of photography. But it was in that same time where I lost what I was really taking photos for, that that feeling. And that was a, that was a terrible feeling. And it took me some time to find it again. And I have, and I did. Um, but social media, the pressure of being accepted and being somebody um, 
can definitely have that effect on you. And sometimes it's a great thing because if you are a landscape photographer or you are passionate about hiking and all that stuff, then you're going, you know, the types of photography that revolved around that time, you know, that were very popular, um, you know, if you made it off of that because that's what you were into, that's great. But for me, it was like, I always kind of felt like it's not really, it's not really me. And then I felt like if I do start sharing the type of photography that I actually do enjoy and that I, that I feel like is my style, is who I am, yeah. I feel like I won't be liked, you know, and that it sucks that people feel that way or have felt that way before. <laughs> Yeah, we we all been. Well, I I think we all been in in that, like uh, I don't know how to say it, like uh, that vortex of of likes and 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 being being oh, yeah. accepted and and everything. So another addictive thing is is to see that uh, number of likes that that counter yeah. because it, it it shouldn't be the way we 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 share and and the reason because the reason of we, what we share shouldn't be exactly. likes should be your your to share your i think it's very very interesting because a, a picture is like sharing the way you think the way you process the way you you store images in your in your head because it's not it's not the same like telling a story or describing a a memory than showing it the the way the way you like the way you saw it the way you you save it for yourself i think mm -hmm. that's very nice of, of photography and so erica now that you've been through all this uh, the the social media fever how do you <laughs> exactly, define the fever. <laughs> yeah <laughs> how do you define your style now how, where are you right now in, in in photography that's a great question so i feel like So it's very interesting. When I first started photography, like I said, I took photos of anything. But I did get commissioned when I was living in Miami to shoot like events mm -hmm. and weddings. And I would dabble and, you know, I really was more passionate at the time of like portrait photography and then just capturing day to day. Um, for me, I always really liked just capturing people and their elements and their environment, you know, just things happening when it was happening, like life going by, you know, that was kind of my favorite thing mostly. But I also did love shooting portraits, so I would do that. I did enjoy the wedding part, like the very few that I did. I, I loved capturing like the emotion because it, with wedding photography, it kind of blended two worlds, like life going by and also portraits, you know, it was like kind of those two things. And then you're ca also capturing an intimate moment. So who wouldn't, you know, who wouldn't want to do that? That's special. Um, but I wasn't super passionate about it. I kind of just liked, you know, maybe it was like a, maybe it felt a little isolated, but I kind of just liked capturing photos that I thought were interesting of just like life happening, um, for myself, you know, but I knew that that wasn't like what, like I said, you know, people wanted to see or what was popular at the time or anything like that. But anyway, I kind of just dabbled. And so, but for me, my biggest thing was, you know, portraits and street, you know, that was really what I enjoyed mostly. It wasn't until, you know, so I had the Instagram fever for a long time, you know, and um, it caused me to meet a lot of great people though. So it was a yeah. great time as well. You know, I can't say that I regret it or anything like that because I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about what I liked and what I didn't like. And if I was willing to wake up at 3.30 in the morning to go photograph a sunrise at the top of a mountain, or yeah. if I wanted to sleep in and shoot golden hour instead in the city, you know? So those things was what ultimately helped me realize, no, that's not, that's not who I am. Um, but it wasn't actually until I moved to Japan in 2018. So I had, a, I had my 5D Mark II and that was my camera for forever and ever and ever. And I'm very sad about it because I actually did end up selling it, which I regret now because okay. <laughs> mostly regret it because not because of the camera itself. I regret it because of the emotional tie I had yep. to it with it being my first yeah. camera gifted by my grandfather. Yeah. So yeah, I regret that aspect of it. But when I moved to Japan in 2018, I took my camera with me and I took it everywhere. And it, it was there where I really just like captured 
any and everything happening just because I wanted to really document my time there. But then I also realized, wow, I really love shooting street. But it was really hard to shoot street with such a huge camera. Mm -hmm. And so during that time, I said, okay, I'm going to buy myself a smaller camera. And at first, I thought about getting like an X100, um, like a Fuji X100. I think at the time, it was like the F. And, um, you know, I thought, okay, maybe I'll just get this. It's a fixed lens, you know, whatever. Just from the go. But then I decided, okay, I'm just going to get one with an interchangeable lens just in case I want to like switch it up, you know, <laughs> just, and in then case. I, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. And then ever since I bought the Fuji, I stopped using the Canon. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I a, I'm a Fuji lover. <laughs> oh, good. Yo, well, we're going to be great friends because yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes. But then it, you know, I just, and I'm, I'm the type of person that very good and bad thing like you know when i get into something i really get into it you know like i i get very obsessed with it you know mm. um so for me you know i i just jumped into the fuji and then i was like oh this is so nice this is so light this is so sharp still the colors i loved everything about it and so i just left my can at home and just collected dust and dust and dust and dust and dust and, dust. <laughs> and at that time, yeah, I just was shooting a lot of film and then a lot of the Fuji, you know. Um, so then I did ultimately decided I'm just going to fully convert. So that's when I fully converted to Fuji and really started shooting more street. Um, and then I that's when I, I felt like I finally found my style. And then, it, you know, it just got to a point where I was like, you know what, I, I don't care anymore. I'm not going to post whatever I think makes people happy. I'm just going to share whatever I enjoy. and. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah, actually, know. before this interview, uh, Beto uh, was told me, I think every case into Fuji because the colors and because of this and that. <laughs> and I was like, maybe, maybe. But, uh, but right now, I know that you are into Fuji, Fuji yeah. colors and Fuji cameras. And, and actually, I love <laughs> actually on, on film photography, did you use Fuji film or which is your favorite um, film stock for example yeah so great question uh <laughs> used to be fuji 400h i know oh, expensive yeah. film yeah. and really i shouldn't have been shooting it because i'm not like a wedding photographer or anything mm -hmm. like that i mean whatever that's all to me that's all you know um it's up to you and what you what you're willing to spend your money on you know <laughs> <laughs> but um it's subjective, you know, film is very, the type of film is very subjective, just like photography is very subjective, you know, um, let me open this light up here, it's getting a little dark. Um, so it just depends. But for me, I really loved the color of Fuji 400H, like the skin tones, I really loved the greens, and mm -hmm. just the color was very, it was very Fuji, it was very muted, but still vibrant, if that makes sense. Yeah, I don't know yeah, how to yeah. explain that. I did not like I, I liked Portra 160 and I liked Portra 800 because I felt mm. like they had very similar um uh, like skin you know um uh, color gradients you know mm. and like skin tones the way that they would appear were kind of like almost like a creamier color whereas like Portra 400 was too warm for me you know um I wasn't very into like the warm I was more into like cooler tones so that's why I liked 800 Portra 800 and then Fuji 400. But it's since then discontinued, as you know. So RIP. Mm, yeah. I have a lot of rolls in my in my fridge though <laughs> that I've like I'm keeping for a long time. But um, my favorite film stock, like if it wasn't discontinued, if I could have it in the loads, you know, like truck loads, it would actually be Fuji Natura sixteen hundred. Oh okay. yeah. To me, that's my favorite film ever. Also discontinued. Yeah. So I have a terrible. Yeah taste terrible pattern <laughs> but now now it's actually kodak gold 200 which is which is interesting because it's not any of the portraits it's just a cheap phone but i don't know yeah. i just really love the the color of gold it's it's beautiful that, yeah, yeah and that's that's uh that's a good example of you don't care about the pro line and you don't care about the the status of the this is the best uh, film for portraits for example portrait no? 
So you go for your feelings, uh, what you like, and you like yes. gold. So that's gold. And I do love gold. So that's yeah. that's important. That's that's the good stuff. When you like something and you make your work works with that film, actually. So yeah, like for me, mm. I don't like Fuji Natura because it's fifty dollars a roll. Yeah, <laughs> you know? oh, that's yeah. not why I like it. You know, I like it because it's the grain is beautiful. Um, and I love the colors. Like I, I, you know, I think the skin tone, like Fuji has to me, like such pretty skin tones. However, I will say my friend recently took photos with Fuji. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, with, um, Kodai Portra 400, which again, mm -hmm. her and I actually both do usually would not like Portra 400 because how warm it is, but she actually underrated it. So she overexposed okay. it. I think yeah. she rated it at 100 and yeah. it was surprisingly really beautiful. Like I was very, it, it, I was impressed. Yeah. So it kind of looked, it almost looked like Fuji 400 age, which was yeah. kind of interesting. Yeah. That, that, formula, that, that <laughs> formula, it's, it's very famous, like, uh, over, overexposed uh, by two stops, the Portra 400. And that's like the sweet spot that everybody, Everybody That's likes. a sweet spot. And yeah. I mean, now with the industry, right, with now with 400H being discontinued, I feel like that's how everybody is shooting Portrait 400 to try to get like that creamier, airier yeah. kind of look that everybody really loved 400H for. Like you can get that by overexposing Portrait 400. And so I haven't personally shot it yet. Usually I shoot 800 and push it, you know, two stops. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll usually, well, actually, I guess pull it. I'll underexpose it uh, or rate it at, I'll rate it at like 200 or even 100 sometimes. And for me, like that's, I love 800 at that, at 100. And I feel like, yeah, like the greens are a little bit better. The the skin tones are nicer, you know, like it's not as warm because the portrait can be, you know, all portraits are, are warm in yeah. a sense. But if you overexpose them, the latitude is it changes. You know, it just the color gradient changes too. So yeah. But yeah, I still think that gold is my favorite out of all of them. And I mean, like it's like you said, David. Like I, I like the pro lines. I do. But I guess I'm impressed with the results from Kodak Gold. And so for me, that's like okay. Like it's a win-win. Like I like the color. I like yeah. the way it looks. I like the the grain. <laughs> And I also like that it's affordable, of course. Yeah. <laughs> it fits it fits with you in every aspect, so that's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very similar to me because I, I also like obviously the, the pro line of, of a, any brand, but I, I also enjoy a lot to shoot with Fuji C two hundred, which is a non professional uh, film. It is cheap, but it is beautiful. I love the, yeah. the the tones it rendered, the grain, everything. It, it's like my my go-to uh, film stock for, for like everyday, everyday use. For me, it's too green. Yeah. It's well, very I, green. <laughs> I, I shoot it, I always overexpose minimum by one stop. Maybe one and a half stops, but that's the, the kind of, of look I like. But if you underexpose it a little bit it, it should be muddy green like green brownish strange strange tonality in, in the shadow so don't yeah. underexpose c200 <laughs> yeah and it's funny you say that because i feel like fuji film is a lot less forgiving when you underexpose if you underexpose than like kodak is mm -hmm. i feel like i like the colors i like you know, and, and it's funny because that's kind of a style now. I don't know if you guys have seen the trend, but now like underexposed film photos are kind of like moody and people mm -hmm. like it, you know. Um, but for me, yeah, like I actually prefer like, you know, I mean, it happens, you know, sometimes I'll underexpose a photo in my roll of film. But for whatever reason, I'm much I'm much happier with the results if it comes from a Kodak film than with a with a Fuji film, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it, it it it's more forgiving in in the shadows when you underexpose. Yeah, I, I it's not that. I mean, it 
it gets m like moody and 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 color shifting, but in a in a more aesthetical way, if if, mm -hmm. if we we sh we may say, yeah, yeah, it is. So I actually shot Kodak Ektar on a okay. really okay. yeah, very rare. I shoot Ektar because I'm not <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a huge so fan of like the super punchy colors. Yeah, but what's yeah. funny is I did shoot it on a very gloomy, moody Pacific Northwest day, which is not when you should shoot Ektar at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and how it went? It actually came out really cool. It was very, like, the colors were very punchy, but it had, how do I explain it? It had, like, it had like an underexposed moody feeling to it, but it wasn't like actually that underexposed looking, you know, like it okay. wasn't super faded. It wasn't super like dark and muddy and underexposed. It just looked like, I don't know, gritty, you know, I, I mean, I wish I could like, you know, display it on the screen, but, um, yeah, it it was it was a very interesting look, and so I like Ektar like that. Like when it comes out like that, I mean, I like I love Ektar. You know, I just don't feel like it's my type of film. Like I can exactly you yeah. know my style of film. Yeah, it's very colorful, very beautiful. I I know a lot of photographers that use it, especially ones that live in like more tropical, vibrant weather. <laughs> and for me, that's like beautiful, you know. But I, you know, for where I live and. Just for what I like to shoot, I don't feel like Ektar is the best for me, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's it it's kind of weird because it has almost virtually no grain, so it is uh, like strange to to <laughs> do your you scan your film and and just getting this like almost uh, digital sharpness. It is it is strange, but it needs a lot of light. I uh, I think. I would love to see those those pictures that that you say that the, it was like a gloomy day because I don't know I I can't imagine how how me neither, me neither. how that came up. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> I don't know why I decided <laughs> to shoot that film that day, but it came out really cool. And like, yeah, I'll have to show you. It's um, it's very interesting. But if you're ever curious, you should try it because it's it's cool it's a cool effect for sure it's not it's not something i would shoot regularly because it still is very punchy with the colors but yeah um it was just it was different it was unique you know i mean usually i see photos of like mexico or florida in ektar or hawaii you know like very mm, colorful yeah. places and it's just so bright and beautiful and i mean every film is beautiful to me in its own way you yeah. know i just feel like it deserves um a particular subject it deserves a particular photographer to you know to to really own it yeah so it is the favorite is kodak uh gold uh, right now but, yes that i can but, have my, that i can actually get my hands on <laughs> <laughs> okay and with uh with what camera would you love what what is your favorite camera right now yeah, it's a hard this one. This is such a hard question. I feel like, and you know, I feel like I've answered this question so many times, and no matter how many times I answer it, it's never, it's never easier. Um, it's so hard because it's like, what? How do I feel that day? <laughs> you know, like okay, yeah, 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 totally. You know, like, like, do I feel like what kind of photos do I feel like that day for me for me like the camera that I choose to well first of all let me back up okay <laughs> I'm not the kind of person unfortunately I wish I was that could just have one camera and one lens and just that's it that's it <laughs> you know like that's it I saw that, this that, like that interview kind of once people with... is very strange to to find actually right now <laughs> it is very strange it's true because there's, you know, there's that whole uh, gas, right? The yeah. deer mm -hmm. acquisition syndrome, yeah. right? I have it. For yeah. Sure. You guys I, have it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can't see mine. Good. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's here. Um, but um, yeah. So I, you know, for me, I I definitely 
there was one interview I saw this older gentleman. I can't even remember his name. I wish I did because I talk about this all the time. I don't even know how I came across it. I think someone sent it to me, but I saw an interview. It was a Leica photographer. I know. Okay. Before you start rolling your eyes, you know, uh, it was a Leica photographer and he was like, I just want this camera and a 50 millimeter and that's it. Mm-hmm. Like 50 millimeter. That's it. Mm-hmm. And you know, the way that he spoke about it was like, you know, I know the camera in and out. I know this lens. I know this focal pan- focal length. I see already, you know, ahead of time in 50 millimeter. Like I see the frame. I see the composition yeah. in 50 millimeter, you know. I wish I had that. I would love to have that, you know, because the way he described it very much reminded me. So I went to culinary school and I studied to be a chef. And oh, great. it's funny. I know. So it's funny because going back to like, when did photography really happen for you? So that it was around that time. So when I went to Japan, um, I was working as a cook out of culinary, straight out of culinary school. And, you know, for me, working in a kitchen was super stressful. So photography kind of became like my way to yeah. relax and my hobby yeah. outside of working in a kitchen, you know? Um, so for me, you know, I just felt like when he said that, like, you know, the camera, when you know it in and out, when you have just one, when you have just one focal length, it becomes an extension of your hand. It reminded me so much of like what they used to tell us in culinary school, your knife becomes an extension of your hand for an artist too, right? A paintbrush becomes an extension of their hand. And so I'll tell you what, my 5D Mark II was an extension of my hand because for the longest time, it was my only camera. It was my only camera. I only had, funny enough, a 50 millimeter at the time. <laughs> and, and you know, it was it was literally, yeah, it was an extension of, of my hand. And I knew that camera back to front, upside down, in and out, everything, you know. So when I get asked this question, I always think like, man, I really, like, I don't have that feeling with any of my cameras, which is sad. I love them all. I use them all. But I don't feel like there's one camera that like I feel like is an extension of my hand. Because the problem that happens when you have so many cameras and you do shoot them is that once you go down the line of shooting them, when you go back to the front and you start shooting them again, you're like, oh, how did I do this again? How do I do this again? Like, how- yeah. <laughs> and so that's what kind of sucks about having so much gear, you know, but at the same time, I love having options because for me i'm not always in the mood to shoot 35 millimeters sometimes i want to shoot medium format sometimes i want to shoot digital sometimes i want to shoot film you know so it's it's hard to answer that question but to answer your question (laughs) today's favorite camera just today today's today's favorite camera if i had to you can look at them you can look at your cameras i know i am looking at them i keep looking at them um if i was like stuck on you know if here's here's how i always think about it if my house were to catch on fire okay. and, I could only, okay. and I could only bring one, save one. Yeah. The fireman says, <laughs> says that you can yeah. only enter for one camera. <laughs> you can only go back for one, yeah. you know, um, it would be my Pentax six, seven. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, a beautiful camera. It's a beautiful camera. Because it would also serve as a weapon. No, I'm just yeah, kidding. No. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, yeah, I think it's also it's, for for workout. Just I think <laughs> workout, you know, like shooting with that is like a, is. a day workout. It's yeah. CrossFit photography <laughs> in one camera. I should. <laughs> I just feel like I have a lot of emotional ties to my camera, and I've actually been blessed. That's a whole nother discussion. I've been ble- I have really crazy stories with my cameras, which okay. we, we can get into if you want. But okay, yeah, please, please. My Pentax Six Seven. Um, you know, was a, was a kind of a gift to me, almost, not really, kind of. So very similar to my grandfather's story. Mm. Uh, one of my really, really good friends, close friends, consider him like a brother. Um, his sister's my best friend. And she, you know, she, she actually like had a Pentax 67. She bought one. She always wanted one. Then her brother got one. And they really wanted me to have one. 
<laughs> they really wanted me to be in like the Pentec six seven club, you yeah. know. And so we were camping one day, and there was a, a camera shop, a Treehouse Hawaii, that had one in stock. And he was like, mm -hmm. "Erica, you have to get this camera. You should get it. Be in our club. I'll buy it." <laughs> I was like, I, "I was like, I can't afford it right now." He goes, "I'll buy it. You pay me back little by little." So very similar to my grandfather. Oh story. yeah. Oh nice. Yeah, and so I was like, "Are you guys?" serious like I, <laughs> you really want me to have the camera that bad um so i was like oh, okay okay fine i mean I, at that point i couldn't say no you know and yeah. um and so i did it and i did and i paid him back very fast because i don't like owing people money but you know i paid him back and um and so for the longest time like you know it was us three and our pentex six sevens it was a lot of fun um he actually passed away in 2018 oh. from cancer yeah and um so because of that i have like a very close emotional tie now to that camera you know Definitely. and i mean it's a beautiful camera it's one of the most beautiful medium formats out there you know um but that's also part of like why i would not you know that would be my one because i couldn't i wouldn't be able to let it go exactly and and you learn about um you canon uh, fight experience you, you experience exactly you you learn about it so i know. learned from it yes yeah. i did mm -hmm. so that's 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 important that uh, that attach that we have with the gear because mm -hmm. it's only metal and screws and you know yeah exactly and glass but it had something else and it does so because great. you know what's interesting is like i I did regret selling my Canon after I did it. But at the time I kept telling myself, well, I did it because I wasn't using it. And I now have a camera I am using, which is my Fuji. And, you know, I should, I should be doing that. I should be evolving and, you know, mm -hmm. growing into my photography and, and actually get something that I know I'm going to use instead of just letting it sit there. And, I, you know, I didn't have money to just completely convert to a new camera system either. So that was partially why. But then, so that happened in 2018 that I sold all my Canon gear. And then in 2019, my grandfather passed away. And it was like, that's when, yeah. that's when it really hit me. And I was like, I mean, I have a lot of things, you know, um, how do you say it? Um, Like, uh, how do you say it in English? See, this is what happens to me. Sometimes I forget <laughs> something in English. You, you can say it in Spanish, don't worry. <laughs> like, recuerdos, like... Um, Memories. Yeah, but like tangible things, like um, mementos. Okay, well, that's what moments, I was Like yeah. mementos, you know? Moments. So my, mm, yeah. I have like my grandfather's ring. I have, you know, so things like that. So I do oh, have, yeah. Things, yeah. you yeah. know, that like, that I, you know, have of him, but the camera was still very special and I, I still regret it. So yes, because of that, I learned from that. And now yeah. like I could never get, you know, part with my, with my Pentax 6.7. And, and yeah. which, and which lenses do you have for the Pentax 6.7? I do have the Takumar, the, um, the 105. The 105. Okay. That's a, yeah. that's a good one. That's a that's, excellent that's like lens. The, you know, the common one. <laughs> Yeah, it's beautiful. It's like the most. It's beautiful, actually. Yeah, beautiful for beautiful. portraits, it's fantastic. Oh yeah, the the depth of field, the separation yeah. that you get with that mm. lens and the medium format is just yeah, it's it's crazy. Yeah, it it's looks crazy. really like three dimensional. Like that's how I feel like the Pentax <laughs> photos always look like. They just look so poppy, you know, like they just. The separation, the subject separation, is just it's it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. and for for me, the Pentax to seven has the best west level viewfinder. It's mm. it's I don't know what it's that what it is, but for me, it's magical. It's uh, it's it's mm. bigger and it's uh, I don't know. It's I don't have the waist level viewfinder. I don't know. But I don't need it, so I'm not gonna. You can you can um, put up the the prism, and you can check mm -hmm. the with the the focus screen, and it's, mm -hmm. I don't know it had some some magic in it. It's fantastic. The so focus screen on the Pentax Six Seven, yeah. and I just have like the first version, but it's mm -hmm. you know, it's beautiful. I do it's love terrible. it, and I would have liked to have like the the two the Pentax Six Seven two, but 
I don't know. I get scared too when like you start getting into like um, film cameras with electronics. It, yeah. It's scary, mm, you know, yeah. because anything can happen and then it's super expensive and like, do people even fix them anymore? You know? Um, yeah. One of my cameras, one of the ones that has a really crazy story, which I don't know if I should be on camera saying these stories because I feel like people will hate me. <laughs> um, no, don't worry. If I talk about how I got some of my gear, people will be like, Oh my gosh. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, don't worry about it. Um, so my very first film camera was my Rolleiflex, actually. Okay. Um, yeah, the Rolleiflex. The 2.8 or 3? 2.8. 2.8 E. Yeah, actually, yeah, I actually have it here. Yeah. A little, little, little guy. Cool, with so, the case and all the stuff. Yeah. Well, the case I got separately. Okay. So, and the case I got separately, and I do have the mirrored. Uh, yeah, that that's that cap. thing of the Rolleiflex. That thing, the lens cap, it's beautiful. That glass. Beautiful that, design, right? Yeah, that beautiful design. Best yeah. design. Yeah. So this was my first, um, my first film camera. You know, once I really got into film photography. Yeah. Um. This is a lot. This is kind of a long story. I'll try to shorten it though. So basically, <laughs> I, it was like two thousand. It was like 2008, it was like around the time, 2008 or nine, when I got my 5D. And um, at the time, Flickr was huge. You know, it, there was yeah. no Instagram, you know. Um, so I had Flickr and somebody had sent me um, a link to the guy who had found out about Vivian Meyer. Oh, okay. And mm. at the time, he was only uploading on Flickr, you know, very, it was, it was like, nobody knew about him nobody knew about her there was no movie there was no nothing it was like it was like the very beginning you know and i remember someone shared that with me it was like oh look how cool this guy like bought a bunch of negatives from a, you know uh like a estate sale or whatever and and look at the photos they're beautiful and when i looked at the photos i saw that she shot with a really flex and i was like oh my god it's so mm -hmm. beautiful so timeless you know it just it just had just a unique look to it and then it was then that i was like wow really flex is so pretty i want one <laughs> you know <laughs> um and what's funny is at the time i was still living in miami and at the time i i was like okay like you know somebody had told me oh you should go to pawn shops in the area because mm -hmm. they always sell like lenses and camera stuff and blah 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 so originally i was going to those pawn shops to look for like dslr lenses for my 5d um so i went with a friend and we started going to different pawn shops and what first was looking for lenses for my DSLR camera ended up being like, we started seeing all these old vintage film cameras. And I was like, Oh man, how cool. Like, so then we just started looking for film cameras. I don't know. It just, the, the you know, the, the journey evolved. Mm -hmm. um, eventually we landed in one pawn shop and like in the case, they just had like little point and shoots from like the nineties, nothing crazy, nothing special. Um, and I was like, oh, is this all you have? And the girl was like, oh, yeah, that's all we have. And I was like, oh, okay. And so then I hear a guy from the back room who's like, hey, I have um, I have a bag here of, of some old cameras if you want to take a look. <laughs> okay. And I was like, okay. And so he comes out with, like, this really old brown leather bag and puts it on the counter. He's like, yeah, you know, I have all this stuff. I don't really know what it's worth. But he's like, if you want, you know. The whole bag is yours for 30 bucks. <laughs> what? Wow. No way. <laughs> that's that's the, that's just the, the good stories. That's the good yeah, stories. good stories, right? Yeah. This was before, long before camera, film camera started rising in prices too, though, but still. So my friend that I was with, funny enough, on the way to all these places, I was telling him about Vivian Meyer and like how my, I found out about her and how I really wanted a Rolleiflex. And I explained what a Rolleiflex was to him, et cetera. He, had, he didn't really know at the time. So he's standing next to me and I open this bag and the very first thing sitting at the top is a rolly flag. So, you know, he, he knows now <laughs> what that is. And he's like, and so we both just like poker put, face. Like, poker face <laughs> and I was just like, <laughs> like, okay. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. You know, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll give you twenty five bucks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I like. Just I only play. have one. I only have one dollar. I don't know you want it. So funny enough, I did only have twenty bucks. Oh come on. on me. Yeah, 
I only had 20 bucks. And so I told the guy, I was like, listen, I'll give you 20 bucks just for this camera, you know, and everything. There was like light meters and like older, like video cameras, which now I should have kept oh, because you yeah. know, Super 8 is back, you know. Yeah. But anyway, so I was like, oh my gosh. And he was like, nah, he's like, I can't, I probably can't sell it all separately. So 30 bucks or nothing. And my friend who knew that I really wanted the Rolex, like, <laughs> he was like, I'll put the 10 and I'll keep everything else. You can keep the, the camera. And I was like, okay. I got to the car and I just started screaming. I quickly <laughs> oh run into the yeah. car. Into the car. <laughs> exactly. And I mean, at the time I looked it up and they were worth like, they were still worth a lot of money. Maybe like it, it wasn't 800. It wasn't a, like 1800 bucks like now, you know, but I think it was like around seven to 800, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I looked it up and it was worth that much. And I was like, okay, wow, that's a really good deal. But I will say it was back focusing, you know? Mm, um, okay. So I did have to get it repaired through a gentleman named Harry Fleen, or you guys probably know him or know about him maybe. Um, he's like one of the very last official original Rolly Flex, you know, technicians. Technician, yeah. um, he still has all the original, like, you know, tools and utensils and everything. So um, he's able to do it. And, um, you know, going back to what I was saying, like, you know, with these camera, the old film cameras that have like electrical components, it's scary mm. because, you know, like Harry Fleenor, he's like one of the very few that can do it. You know, um, there are now people who are starting to learn because they see the rise in film photography and obviously there's business yeah. in it, you know, so I mean, it'd yeah. be silly if like you didn't get into it. Right. But, you know, for the longest time and at the time, when when it was having issues, that was like the only person. And everywhere I went, that I was like, "Can you fix my Rolex?" Like, they're like, "No, nope. Harry Fleener, Harry Fleener, Harry Fleener." Yeah. So I, you know, I got it fixed through him. And and I mean, even though technically it's not an electrical component film camera, the Rolex, as you guys know, is a very intricate, like a yeah. clock. You yeah. know. Yeah. Um, it's it's very very unique in that sense. So there, I gave you a a, a two two part. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's amazing. A story and also why I think, you know. You are so lucky. That's amazing. That's <laughs> an amazing story. You you are so lucky. There I think that one dream of all the film photographers around in the world, around the world is find in a thrift store or on a pawn shop yeah. or on a fleet market a deal like that. Uh, oh, uh, like I'm in tree for one dollar. Uh, wow, wow. Uh, but, you know, that's so, the dream. That's the dream. I have but... a worse story. <laughs> oh no, go on. <laughs> tell us, tell us about it. I'm ready. This is a bad. This is a bad one. Um, <laughs> this is not my best story. <laughs> this is not my best film story. <laughs> I, I've gotten okay. I want to say again. I've gotten really lucky, and I recognize that. You know, I've gotten really lucky um blessed i want to say not even lucky you know just really blessed um yeah. and a lot of this happened when you know i should say a lot of this happened when film photography was not that big of a deal you know exactly. like now it's huge now it's made a huge comeback and it's you know now you hear these you kind of almost start to hear less of these stories i feel like you, you used to hear a lot more of these stories but now you're hearing less and less and less because you know the guy at that pawn shop had he done a little bit of, you know, research, he would have seen that it was worth something. But at the time, people didn't think anything of it. Now people know, you know. Now people yeah, know. yeah, everybody knows now. Yeah. yeah, everybody knows that film cameras have value, especially because film is making such a comeback. My best story with a film camera. God, I'm getting nervous. <laughs> <laughs> what? Do it, do it. <laughs> I'm getting nervous talking about this story because I just feel like so many people hate me because of this. So my best film photography, film gear acquisition, you know, blessing, story, <laughs> blessing, hail Mary, everything. Um, so it is so funny because there's this, there's this YouTuber. I, I think his his YouTube is Grainy Days. Oh yeah, know, Jason. 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 Jason Comerfield. Yeah. Okay he had made a video once that cracked me up it was so funny and i just felt like it was speaking to me in a way because he um he made a video where he was like reviewing a bunch of cameras of all his gear and at the end of each one he'd be like and i got it at a thrift store Dora for five dollars uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i was like 
Why is that always the story? It's true though, kind of, you know, at least that was very similar to mine with the Rolly Flex, you know, but um, this one is not a thrift store find actually. So when was it? I think it was like 2014. Okay. 2014. So again, film is like slowly coming back. Still yeah. wasn't like yeah. full throttle like now, you know, but it was, it was starting to come back. Um, my friend who worked at an electronic store, just like a regular electronic store, I won't name any name. She worked at an electronic store, um, had Snapchat and she, um, she sent me a snap or she posted a snap and she was like, Oh, somebody brought in a box of cameras to, um, recycle. Oh, come on. Cause they had, they had a recycling program. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody so brought a box of yeah. Somebody threw away a, 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 a carry on, carry on. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. just got got excited. Yeah. So somebody came in with a box of cameras, and this is like a really nice part of town. So you know, it's expected that somebody would probably have some really nice gear. My guess is like someone passed away. Family was like, "Oh, what is this? You know, film yeah, junk yeah. from years ago. I'm just gonna recycle it." And this store's policy is like they can't. You know, they they can't salvage anything that somebody brings in for recycle. They have to go through with recycling it. So they posted the snap and I'm looking and I see a Leica M6. No and I way. said, no way. I said, oh my God. And my friend doesn't know about cameras. She doesn't know about anything. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> and so I start texting her and I'm like, you cannot recycle that camera. <laughs> I was like, I don't care what I have to do. You cannot recycle that camera. I'm telling you right now, like, please, uh, who do I have to talk to? Who do I have to negotiate with? What, what, what story do I have to concoct? Because it, it, it's, it's, I can't, I, I just, I can't, yeah. you know, like I just had like this feeling in my chest, like my heart was crumbling, you know? So she was like, oh no, I can't, you know, like uh, our policies, you know, we can't, you can't really talk to anybody, blah, blah, blah. And, and so I said, okay, what if I go in there and pretend to be the person that dropped them off and say I made a mistake? <laughs> and she was like, <laughs> and she was like, I guess, I guess that might work. I, I guess that, that's the way. Yeah, yeah. I guess I can't <laughs> stop you. you know? That was very smart for you, actually. Because at the time, I was just like thinking about everything. Like, yeah. how do how can I do this? You know, and I'm not I'm not usually like you know a liar or uh, somebody who does sneaky things. You know, like I'm a terrible liar. I, ha I usually have a really terrible poker face. You know, and like I'm the worst. I get so nervous and shaky, and you know, I get I get red, and you know, I get very I, I like I can't lie. You know, I'm terrible. If you know me, you'll know something's wrong with her. You know? so, but anyway, I was like, can I do that? You know, and she was like, well, I guess. You know, I can't stop you. So you better believe. I left work early. I made up some excuse like, oh, I feel terrible. Yeah, I left work early. I drove all the way over there. I went in there shaking everything. I, you know, I, I was like, I had like tunnel vision, you know, like I couldn't, couldn't see. <laughs> I was like sweaty, you know, and I went up to the person. I was like, uh, and I was like, my grandfather came earlier because I heard it was a man, an older man. And I said, my okay. grandfather came earlier and dropped off a box of cameras. And one of them was in the bunch that wasn't supposed to be. And the guy was like, listen. I can't do, I can't do anything. I'm like, you know, he's like, usually these things get dropped off and we can't go through it and we can't, you know, whatever. He's like, but I guess since it is going to get recycled anyway, you know, whatever. And so I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so he brings the box over and then I start going through it. And I don't even like, I was like so nervous. I was like my hands, I couldn't, like I said, I just had tunnel vision. So I was just like, <laughs> When people ask me all the time, like people that I've told this story to, they're like, what else was in there? And I was like, I don't yeah. even know because I yeah. couldn't focus. I All <laughs> I knew was that I was looking for the M6. And once I was going to find it, I was going to get out of there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I don't even know what else was in there. 
have no idea. But I found the M6. It was in like a leather case and everything. Okay. You know, the original like a leather case. And I, and I saw it and I was like, and then I, I didn't even know how to open the thing, the case. I, that's how nervous I was. I was like, I don't even know how to open it and, and confirm it's this one, but I think it is. And then finally, like I, I was able to, I was like fumbling, you know, the guy must've been like this girl, like what is wrong with this girl? You know. <laughs> but then finally I got in, I saw them. I was like, Oh, this is it. This is it. This is the one. And he was like, okay. And I was like, and he was, and he even asked me, he's like, are you, he's like, he's like, is there any, anything else? And I was like, no, I was just so scared. I was like, no, that's it. <laughs> and I like, you know, basically go straight for the exit, get out the door. My friend is in the car and she, she knows everything that's going on. She sees me coming and she's just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my crazy. Wow. That's I, a good story. I, yeah, it yeah, is I a great saved. story. You 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 shouldn't be uh, uh, like ashamed, ashamed and no. nervous, the guy, because you saved that camera. You saved I it. did. Yeah. You yeah. You. Yeah. Risk. Yeah. Of course. This is my so this is my pride and joy. And and it, it comes with a lens, or it, it came was... with a lens. Oh no, my! It's. <laughs> <laughs> it came with a. Uh, I'll, I'll just show you what it came with. The Sumi um, looks one one point four. <laughs> yeah. Or the Nutty Lux Zero. Yeah. This wow. is my baby. No, no, it's beautiful. So wow. it came with a 50 millimeter Sumi Lux 1.4. Oh my you know, God. It just and people ask me, like, like, you know, your one and only camera, how come it's not the M6? It's just so hard. You know, I have so many cameras, and some of them, these three, especially this one, the Rolleiflex and the Pentax, they have such unique stories, like, such. Yeah such a you know emotional tie i can't pick one but if you know obviously the one that's tied to a person mm -hmm. is the one that i pick you know yeah and actually but, they they those three cameras are very different very different because leica m6 is uh, it's a perfect it's a perfect machine a range finder machine and the roll yeah. is the TL, tlr and six by the, six, they're all different formats. Six, yeah, you have... the, exactly different formats. And the Pentax V7, it's it's a monster and it's a weapon. It and it's all <laughs> exactly. it's like a Swiss Swiss uh, how do you Swiss say Army it? knife. Yeah, <laughs> Swiss Army knife. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah, I mean, I I love my I love shooting the Leica. It's my you know, it was always my dream 35 millimeter, but it just felt so mm. far. I mean, even 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 more so now because they're so expensive now, but at the time they were still expensive, yeah. you know, especially with that lens combo, you know, but for me, I was like, you know, I mean, I love it. It's my, you know, I was like, my gosh, this is my favorite 30. It's my dream 35 millimeter. And that's why. And that's what I told my friend. I was like, that's my dream camera. You cannot recycle that thing. Like, you know, like <laughs> I can't sleep knowing that thing is going to become a toaster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? In this moment, so, it will be a toaster or something like that, and maybe or batteries or something. You know? Something, yeah. something useless, something useless uh, hanging around over I there. I couldn't even, I couldn't even uh, imagine. And you know, thinking back on it, I wish I would have just taken the whole box because those poor cameras, you know, whatever else was in there. But you know, I did save the one, so at least I at least tried. You know. Yeah, I'm sure it was a, a great a lot of great cameras or, or gear in that in that box. Yeah. You should have probably other like the whole thing. Know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe the guy the, the guy in the store was like, "Well, what can what can I do with all these Leicas? Why is Leica?" <laughs> I know, I know. I think about it all the time, but I I try not to dwell on it because it makes me feel no. terrible. You no. know, but that was I, the one meant for you. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That yeah. was the one. Universe converse in that moment for you. <laughs> I the, the still to this day, you know, I mean, you know, <laughs> seriously, like, I mean, I don't know what else to say. I, I just, I, it's one of those things where it's like, like you said, like it, it just happens for you. It just happens to you. And, you know, it just, it was meant to be, you know, it really was meant to be. And so I just have gotten really, I've gotten really blessed, you know, with, with, with the cameras that I have gotten. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I have paid for some of my cameras, you know, <laughs> like I don't want people <laughs> thinking that I just always come out, you know, for free, like the Pentax, I technically paid for it, you know, 
but my really, yeah, my really Fox and my like M6 were two very unique instances and stories for me. And, and um, I've gotten, I've gotten a little lucky with point and shoots too, but you know, nothing to that's, that's, you know, $5 versus a hundred and something usually. Well, you know, yeah. it's, not, it's not, it's not that crazy. Uh, although I will say one of my favorite point and shoots, it actually got stolen. I had it in a backpack that got stolen and I oh, did no. for like, I did get it for like less $5 or less at a thrift store. It was a Konica C35. I love mm-hmm. that point and shoot. Love that point and shoot. And it got stolen and like, I've tried to replace it, but I'm like, in my heart, I'm like, how can I pay for a camera that costs me less than five dollars now? It's like one hundred eighty dollars online, you know. But says the girl who got a free Leica. So I mean, yeah, I'm stupid like that, I guess. You know, that's that's amazing. This this uh, chat was like it it evolves to the gears acquisition show because we are you are sharing all the stuff, all these <laughs> stories, and that's amazing actually. I know. I'm have, sorry. I got. You are so lucky. You are so lucky. Yeah. So so lucky. <laughs> lucky, lucky. Yeah. So funny. You you mentioned uh, Jason from from Grainy Days because Grainy Days. I don't know if 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 we can tell David. You tell me. I don't know when when the the episodes are the gonna. Schedule? Uh, <laughs> huh? The schedule or what? The... Yeah, I don't know how how are they gonna be published, but. Uh, we She's just part... we recently had Jason yeah. in in this show. Oh, yeah. awesome! Actually, he's he's it... awesome to to. I like watching his videos. He's very yeah. even though he's hilarious. Yeah, he, yeah, he's so funny. I was gonna say even though he has almost like a monotone way of speaking, <laughs> like he's not well at least on at least on his YouTube channel, like he's not very. You know, like there's other people that are like, "What's up, guys?" and like very engaging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he's very laid back and very like, you know, like whatever, this is me, this is who I am. And I like that. I really like that about, you know, certain, those are the types of people I like to watch usually. It's like when you could tell it's just, that's who they are and, you know, you take it or leave it kind of thing. But yeah, he was, that that video, that one video was so funny. It was every (laughs) time he mentioned when he was like, and I got it at a film store or or thrift store for $5. For $5. (laughs) Yeah, actually he he called himself like, uh low energy guy or something like that right mm. Beto? yeah the low energy internet internet guy <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> i love that yeah That's he awesome. told him so that so erica so um talking about uh, more into your photography work um how mm, how much influence has your latin american roots and maybe your trips to japan into your photography so funny and so it's funny because um it's all you know they say you don't know what you have until it's gone kind of thing and for me or when you don't have it anymore and for me i feel like you know growing up in miami when i left miami i had a bit of a culture shock you know because everybody speaks spanish um, the culture, the the Latin culture in Miami is is so heavy. It's so it, it it's so influenced in every in everyone and everything. And you don't really understand that until you leave, you know. And I feel like people in South Florida don't real. I mean, if you were born and raised in Miami, like how I was and my friends were, you just don't get it, you know. You 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 think that's that's how all of America is. And, and it's mm. not, <laughs> you know, it's very different. Um, so I had to relearn some things, you know, like kissing on the cheek and um, being able to speak English and Spanish simultaneously to Spanglish. Right. Yeah. That's not, that's not a, that's not a thing. That's not a thing everywhere else. You know, it's very, very rare. Maybe Los Angeles has a little bit of that too, but yeah. Yeah. I feel like in Miami, it's much more prominent, you know, because, there's just so much, um, so many different Hispanic cultures. So for me at the time when I was living there, you know, I was like, oh yeah, I'm Cuban, yeah, whatever, you know, like, yeah, aren't you? <laughs> kind of thing, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. it's one of those, it's one of those things where it's like you don't think about it too much. But then when, once I left Miami, um, I feel like that's when my appreciation for my culture really, really started to happen, you know. Um, Number one, I had to speak more Spanish, you know, 
on my own, try to figure out how so that I wouldn't forget it. Because even though I grew up speaking Spanish my whole life, and that was technically my first language, you, if you don't practice it like anything else, you start to forget it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So that was the first thing. Number two, it was just like, you know, explaining to people like, oh, where are you from? Like your accent, you have a little bit of an accent, you know, or like maybe my personality, you know, that East Coast mixed with also just Hispanic because loud and animated and talk with my hands, mm-hmm. very yeah. Cuban, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, things like that. And so I think that leaving Miami was what really inspired me to be more proud of my background and who I am and where I come from. And, you know, um, just, just, you know, just like the Cuban heritage and customs, you know, and things like that. So, so yeah, when I left Miami, it's funny, I would go back to visit every year because my grandparents were still alive and I made it a point to, you know, try to see them as much as I could, you know? Um, So every year, you know, that I had vacation time, I wouldn't go anywhere else. I would actually go to Miami to see my family. And um, every time I went, though, I felt like I went with a fresh pair of eyes, you know. Mm. So it was interesting. Like, I saw Miami in a way that I didn't see it when I lived there. And, you know, I saw more of the people and more of the culture. And so I would photograph more of, like, the, you know, the Cuban things that are in, like, Little Havana and La Calle Ocho, you know, like, very you know, like characters, people from there, people who make Miami what it is, you know, and I was very drawn to that. And then the colors and the pastels of Miami too. And so I just started, it. that kind of, you know, really inspired me to kind of shoot more of back home and, and just see things, like not go to a place, not feel like you have to go to a new place to get new photos or to take better photos or to take new photos, you know, you just have to sometimes take a break or take a step back from where you live. um, And then just learn to kind of appreciate those places again. And from a new perspective, because Mm -hmm. that's ultimately what happened to me. I felt like, Oh, Miami is so boring. There's nothing here. Cause I was born and raised there, you know, um, there's nothing here. It's the same old, same old beaches, flat net, you know, whatever. So I was like, I want to go to the mountains. I want to go where there's fall and winter. I want to go where there's lakes and rivers, and you know. And so obviously leaving Miami, coming here, I was inspired to shoot here because it was different, you know. Exactly. But then yeah. like being away from it, I realized, oh, Miami has its own beauty and it's different. And, you know, I just felt inspired again to capture it in a way that I hadn't seen it. Maybe somebody like an outsider would see Miami, right? Colorful, vibrant, you know, the different types of people that live there, the melting pot, you know, so, so that definitely um, inspired me. And I feel like being Cuban American, you don't, first of all, it's, there aren't a lot of female photographers and well, there are a lot of female photographers. There are not a lot of female photographers that get the recognition that they deserve, you know, and like any industry, um, women are oppressed in that sense. You know, it doesn't matter what industry, right. Women have to claw their way to the top a lot of the times more than men do, you know, let's be honest. And even more so as a Hispanic Latin woman, you know, any type of woman of color, it's even harder for any woman of color to make it to the top, you know? So it's like a double battle, you know, even though technically I, I, you know, people don't know what I am. (laughs) People look at me like, "Mm, is she like European or Middle Eastern (laughs) or Hispanic? I can't tell, you know? So I definitely, you know, obviously Cuban background has a lot of all of that, first of all, but um, anyway, So, yeah, like I I definitely feel like, you know, I I feel like I want to be at least recognized for that, too. You know, like my work is one thing, but I also want people to, you know, recognize my heritage, recognize my background, um, the fact that I'm a female photographer, the fact that I am a female street photographer, the fact that I'm a female Cuban American street photographer, you know, like all those things make me ultimately who I am. And um, yeah, I mean, it definitely has an influence for me, on me for sure. And I think just with the whole Japan thing too, it's just ever since I was very young, I loved 
Japan customs and the language and the fashion and the food and the animation. And I mean, there are a lot of people out there that love Japan for so many reasons. And so from a very young age, I, I always kind of felt gravitated towards Japanese things. Mm-hmm. And um, I, it was always like a goal of mine to learn Japanese and to live in Japan or visit Japan. And, you know, I've been fortunate enough that I've made all three of those things happen to some degree. You know, um, I do speak a little bit of Japanese. I mm-hmm. did live there, even if it was just for three months. I have visited Japan more places than anywhere else, except for Miami. <laughs> so, um <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, it definitely has an influence. And so it's interesting because Cuban culture and Japanese culture are so different. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) You know, so different. Um, Cubans are very outgoing, hospitable, loud and friendly and, you know, um, I guess aggressive, but not in a bad way. I mean, you know, we can be obviously, but like, you know, (laughs) passionate i guess is the better yeah, term yeah, right yeah. we're just hispanic people in general are more passionate we're more you know like i tell my husband all the time don't worry my mom and i aren't fighting it's just the way we talk <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um but it's the truth you know and so and then japanese culture is very different right everything is like you know you have to be more quiet more um respectful uh, very loyal very you know um there's there's like a, there's like a law and order to everything there's like a certain le- level of like obedience with everything and like yeah it's, and people of, of rituals right yeah like they just have such an appreciation for things like the most simplest things and i think that that's the thing that i admire the most you know it's like i just love that organization that obedience that loyalty that that sense of like pride You know, they're Mm -hmm. very prideful. Um, And then, of course, like Japan in general, like the food is amazing, the architecture, the arts, you know, everything. I mean, just how they respect everything, you know, inanimate and animate, right? Like, you know, just living and not living. Like, it's just, it's, it's crazy the level of attention to detail they have for things. And that's why when I, you know, I tell people, you have to go to Japan at least at one point in your life or, you know, any part of Asia, really like, you know, Korea, I would say China too, like there are technology, but I feel like Japan, especially like their technology is so advanced. You don't feel like you're going to another country. You feel like you're going to a totally different world or like traveling to the (laughs) future, you know, because they're just so thoughtful, considerate. Like they have things that you would be like, Oh my God, that's brilliant. Like, why don't we have that? You know? And uh, it could be of the simplest things, but it's just, it's amazing how they really think about those things and consider those things and implement them in their day-to-day life. So um, I feel like that, that order and that, that respect that they have is what really has drawn me in. And, and I don't know if it's, an, if it's necessarily inspired my photography, but I think the country itself is something that inspires anyone. There's just so much happening all the time to see and do um, that it inspires you to want to document it, to shoot it, you know, and share it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. The, those experiences and those, those, uh, how can I say it? atmospheres that just get uh, stuck in your head and in a way transforms the way you want to, the way you see or the, or the way you want to, experience the rest of your life because you you kind of of, of keep uh, a little bit of every every place you you visit well mm-hmm. yeah uh, at least for me it's like that i i'd like okay this peaceful moment i'm uh i will try to replicate it, that at home or i will be i don't know rearrange the 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 furniture because of something i i lived i saw i experienced in another country it is it is great it's it's the magic of of traveling i think yeah that's so true that is so true actually like 100 yeah i mean yeah i couldn't have said that better because i definitely have implemented a lot of things that i learned from living in japan even if it was a very short time um 
I just definitely, I, I definitely had a whole life changing experience when I, when I went there and moved there and, and brought a lot of those same customs kind of back with me, even, even if they were just things that, you know, I was just practicing at the time living there, you know, maybe not necessarily like a life altering event but just little things like you said you know yeah, yeah you definitely carry some of those things back with you from your travels they design who you are they impact who you ultimately yeah, yeah. those are the best totally. sou- those are the best souvenirs that you can bring to home <laughs> that's a great way to, to put it yeah souvenirs. yeah because ever since i moved back like when i moved back i was like became such a minimalist you know yeah i shared, yeah. I shared a room with someone, you know, because that's very popular in Japan, like roommates and sharing rooms, you know, because it's so expensive. And I shared a room and I literally had like half of a room and that was my life. <laughs> I had to make my life in that half of a room. And so when I moved back, I was just like, why do I have all this stuff? I don't need all this stuff, you know? Even with it. my gear, I did it too. I did do a cleanse with my gear okay. and I used to have a lot more cameras and so it got down to like which cameras do i really use and which ones don't i use and and i'm not saying that like if you have a bunch of gear that you don't use you're a terrible person i'm not saying that you know people everybody has (laughs) their stuff (laughs) (laughs) there are so many people who are collectors you know i'm not a collector my goal was to have gear because i just felt like more and more gear i want this gear i want this gear and then my goal was to try to shoot them all all the time which is impossible you know and so for me, I just felt like, what kind of what gear can I give to somebody who's actually going to use it and love it and appreciate it? And, you know, like, so I, I definitely did like a purge of my camera gear. But um, but yeah, I even to this day, like, and it's hard because I have a nine month old daughter. It's hard mm-hmm. to be a minimalist with a child. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, I definitely feel like that came from the influence, the Japanese influence for sure. Yeah, I, I think, I don't know, I, I've never been to Japan, but I think it will be, for me, that kind of impact, because yeah. it is so different culture. It is so, mm-hmm. so uh, I don't know, a, a very beautiful way of, of seeing life itself, mm-hmm. I, I mean, from, from Japanese culture that it will be a, a huge impact on, on who I am. So can't wait to be in, in Japan after yeah. the, all this COVID thing just oh, go away. Japan or Korea, uh, South Korea? I want to go to South Korea too. Yeah. They, they look like amazing countries, amazing cultures, amazing places to go. And everything looks so different So from here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've always wanted to go to Cuba and like when the embargo was lifted and people were traveling there, it, it's it's hard because I had an internal battle. You know, for me, I really wanted to go, but I heard the voices of my family in my head. Like, if you go, you're supporting the government there and the dictatorship and, you know, and so obviously people who are not Cuban don't hear that. And don't feel that guilt, of course. you know. Yeah, and then yeah. when people were going there and shooting it and sharing on Instagram, I felt a little bit envious and jealous because people could go there so freely without that guilt, without that second guess of like, oh, I'm going to Cuba, you know. And it's like, and and I felt like, you know, like damn, like how shameful. Like I'm Cuban and I've never been to Cuba, and I, I, I I'm not sharing photos from my own country, you know. And it's like, yeah it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, I really wanted to go and I really wanted to document it, especially before. Cause I, hopefully, you know, I pray to God all the time that like Cuba will not always be the way it is right now, you know, and eventually it will come out on top and it will defeat, you know, this oppression on the people and this dictatorship and everything. But yeah, who knows when that will be? I mean, obviously we've had some things happen recently, which were, you know, putting things in motion to a degree, but, but not obviously as fast, but nothing happens overnight. So I'm still hopeful. But anyway, you know, like during that time, I really felt like, damn, I really want to go to Cuba. But then I would always remember like my mom or my grandparents, my dad, you know, like, oh, you can't go, you can't go. It's not the same Cuba anyway, you know, you can't go. And 
and give them money and you know so I know my time will come and I will be able to visit one day and hopefully it will be during a time where I don't have that the heaviness of guilt weighing over yeah. me like oh I you know I can't go go back um and support you know um what's going on over there so yeah it's hard yeah it's hard, it's hard. yeah it is it's such a uh, uh it is hard because it's a great people great culture great uh I mean everything, food, musician, sports, uh, doctors. I, I mean Cubans are, are good at uh, at everything. <laughs> it is <laughs> yeah, it is actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know, and it's funny. Like, um, it's interesting that a lot of people don't know that. You know, a lot of I feel like Hispanic cultures and countries know that. You know. Oh yeah. But I feel like outside of that, it's yeah. hard, you know, like to America, a lot, I'm not going to say everyone, obviously, I'm, I'm speaking very broadly here, but to a lot of Americans, Cuba is just Fidel Castro cigars, you know, beautiful <laughs> women, beaches, guayaberas, you know, fedoras, yeah. you know, like very stereotypical, you know, um, so that's what kind of sucks, you know, but, yeah. you know, it, it, it does suck because It, you know, I feel like a lot of people don't know, don't know or understand. I mean, if you want to know and understand or get a taste of what Cuba would be like today had Fidel not taken over, if you go to Miami, it's very much that, you know. Yeah. Um, it just, it really is. Like, that's, you know, that's what Havana would have been like today, yeah. you know. Yeah, um, sure. Cubans made Miami what it is to a, to a degree. You know, obviously now it's gone through all these evolutions but at the time you know yeah it, there's business there's a lot of businesses there there's a lot of you know culture there there's a lot of great food there and a lot of it stems from that you know originality from from what happened in the 60s so yeah i mean yeah i could talk about this for a long time <laughs> we actually, actually, yeah well the, the time will come and and yeah i can sure. can wait to see your pictures of Cuba. Um, yeah. yeah, I would. Uh, yeah. yeah, I would love I, to. Actually, one one teacher from college uh, always told me that the best place to learn how to do a movie or, or how to be a, a really good filmmaker it was in Cuba, actually, because they have uh, I don't know how, how I don't know the name of the school, but they have a really good school for for movie makers and filmmakers. So that was my first or one of the approaches that I have to Cuba, to Cuba, and of mm -hmm. course the one friend is is a doctor, so he's always saying, oh, yeah. "No, if you want to be a really good doctor, you have to be in Cuba because they It's, learn in another way. They, yeah, they learn to heal people for for, for the less, love, like of, for the love yeah. of the of this the, of the medicine." It, mm -hmm. it doesn't look like a business or something like that. It's it's really you have to to take care of the people. So mm -hmm. that's the difference. And yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. It's a. Uh, I always heard that too. My whole life, you know, my grandparents would always be like, "Los cubanos son los mejores doctores." You know, they would always say that. But of course, like I was like, oh, "You're just saying that because you're Cuban," <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> But in fact, you know, yeah, it, I I came to find out, you know, afterwards, like through many, many years and speaking to different people that the best doctors were Cuban, you know, and um, and it's like you say, they do it because they, you know, be, it's not because they have the best technology. It's not because they have the best exactly. resources because they don't, they don't have any of that, you know, so they really do it because they're passionate about healing people, like you said, and something about Cubans, you know, that they always say is like, Siempre pueden resolver, you know, how do you say that in English? Like, um, can always like, um, find a way to find a way, the, deliver, find, a way to, uh, find a way to make the, the things work. So. Yeah, yeah, like always find a way to like uh, resolve a situation, right? I guess mm. is kind of the translation. Um, like, you know, like MacGyver things, maybe people might know that, like, <laughs> you know, like we can <laughs> figure out how to do stuff. But, you know, it's, it's interesting because like, you know, that's, it definitely shows the, um, 
determination of people in Cuba, you know? And I mean, you yeah. see it all the time. You see like a lot of those cars that are there have like boat engines in them, you know, and uh, they fix cars with boat parts and, or they make rafts with like all kinds of crazy things to get to Florida. So, you know, you definitely see the ingenuity there, you know, um, even if they're super behind on the times and, and they don't have the resources for it, they somehow try to make it work. So yeah, the resilience, the resilience of, yeah. of Cuban people is, is, admirable for sure yeah we just yeah. got into like some really deep conversations with that. <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate it yeah. totally not about photography anymore sorry i totally no, derailed right, now this, right now this is, is politics and <laughs> and philosophy <laughs> yeah it is great thank you thank you uh, i mean this is not strictly photography i mean Many times we end talking about life, and and that is great. So <laughs> thank you, life. thank you for <laughs> for sharing your your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, no, of course. I mean, it's it's a big part of who I am, you know. And um, yes, it, it, it you know that's one thing that that's one thing that I can't deny. You know, is like where yeah. I come from and who I am, and it just is what it is. But I just feel like. Yeah, like it's a very, that, to me, that's a very t sensitive subject about photographing Cuba because, like I said, for a long time, I kind of, I, I disliked that people were photographing Cuba and sharing Cuba in a way that it wasn't, you know, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 it was like a facade, you know. Like oh the pretty pastels the old cars the, the the very hospitable people but they didn't show like the grit and the grime and the way people were living and yeah. the lack of like sewage in some places and how buildings were falling apart and how people make no money and like the rations of food and you know like that stuff is all you know very much buried in those photos and nobody really shows it like it is you know and and so that's that's where I think, you know, it was, it kind of sucked to see that, like, you know, people were kind of fantasizing Cuba. Yeah. You mm. know? Yeah. I think, I think like maybe a lot of, of, of uh, Latin American countries have like two sides of it. The, the, yeah. the, the tourist, uh, I don't know how to say it. The, a brochure like, the like, postcard, yeah you know. like the the panoramic view and the the yeah. real the real the real life how it is yeah but yeah it, i think i think it's it, it is coming through more more easily that i mean the the truth the 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 real life the real situation it is uh finding its own way out but yeah i think i'll Many of, of 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 the the new generation of, of photographers are have that compromise to show the the life how it is and to raise that that voice because that's the way that the things are going to change. We're not longer just um, I don't know showing this 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 facade of of the cities. I, I mean, that's that's my opinion. So mm -hmm. I think Cuba has that thing to it. The pictures are like a very, para like a paradise photograph, luxury and everything, and and it's not. It is, it, it's definitely not for the people that live there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's sad. Well, yeah, it's sad. It's crazy, but we will find a way. Uh, One thing I think that really. is nice though and interesting is from anyone that I have heard that has gone to Cuba. The one thing they will say is, you know, even though the country is in shambles, you know, um, mm -hmm. the people are still very kind and yeah, giving that, and hospitable. And I hear that all the time. And that's and, the first thing you hear you hear about about Cuba. The, yeah, and and to me, that's that's really that's really amazing. You know, it's amazing because you know anybody living in that type of situation could feel some type of way about people coming from outside of the of the country to visit you know um they could feel 
they could feel envious and they could feel, you know, feel some sort of spite, you know, um, but I've always heard great things. And I think that that's kind of incredible because it shows the strength and the hope that they have, you know, yeah. like, wow, like, even though they're living in these conditions, like they're still very, you know, they're, they, they are not spiteful. They, they still welcome people and yeah. they still are very giving and caring. So that's, that's, that's really cool to hear. Yeah, it is. Well, for Cuba, <laughs> they, yeah. they will, they will, as you say, they, they will figure it out. They will come out out of this, uh, because of because of that resilience and because of that people and because of that passion for their culture that is the 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 strength there is the 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 strength they need so they will they will come out great out of this so well, i can visit with no with no guilt yeah, yeah. <laughs> photograph it with no guilt and you will enjoy it and you will love that trip when you when you go yeah when it's that. time when it's the right time yeah exactly so okay. just wait for it just like the lake uh, yeah and me, i was I was, I was gonna say maybe <laughs> you'll find a, a camera out there <laughs> yeah oh my god yeah you Can are you so lucky that we... <laughs> I, see that's why i don't like to share that story because everyone's like you're so lucky you're so like and i mean yes <laughs> obviously very lucky and, that and also nice. also that camera was very lucky because that's true it was gonna turn out into a toaster thank you said. thank you thank you thank yeah. you for looking at it like that because yeah i always feel so guilty because i'm like oh, I, know, I know i was i know i was really lucky you know but and you know it's kind of messed up because in a way i don't like to shoot it or take it out or stuff like that because i feel guilty of having it in a way oh come on <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll take it out more. Yeah, yeah no, take it out a lot and and say every that proudly. I, I race rescued this camera. Yeah, yeah. I adopted this camera. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's true though. I mean, I I do feel a little bit of a of a complex, you know, because sometimes when I go to like you know film meetups or stuff like that, you know, like it it's technically like my only like thirty five SLR camera, you know. Um, I have like another one that I just got for a while. It was like my 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 one true love, you know, and and I just always felt like, oh, I'm not gonna be that person to bring the Leica to, you know, like I don't know. <laughs> It's stupid, I know, but like I think it goes back to like that whole like being a people pleaser, and I don't want people to look at me and be like, ah, oh, she's she's a Leica shooter, she's a snobby, you know, and <laughs> like no, I'm not like that at all. I just got really blessed, you know, <laughs> like. So, uh, and right it. now that that you have a, a kid in your house, they, they you can be the this kind of like a mom, you know that I they know, are always right? like the like a dads that are always shooting <laughs> kids kids and uh, no, <laughs> right now you you can do that with your kids. It's so hard to shoot a child with a rangefinder. I will say, it's <laughs> yeah. I need to get better at like zone focusing because she is. Now that she's crawling, I actually shot a whole roll um, two days ago on the on, on the Pentax though. But I shot a whole roll of her, and it was so hard to do because of her moving so much now. And yeah. and she's obsessed with the camera straps. Oh. So uh. yeah, if I'm taking her picture, she just wants to go for my camera strap and grab it and pull the camera. And so you know, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's. I'm gonna need a like I have a I have a Canon EOS 1N, so I'm probably gonna have to use that a lot more now because that's the only thing that's fast enough to to take her photo. Yeah. So. Yeah. The, maybe a, a like no, it's not the 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 best tool to to photograph a child. Only if I'm shooting at like f8 and like everything's gonna be in focus. Oh yeah, in the like... bright sun outside. <laughs> yeah. 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 You can like, use the, the you time. can use a uh, Ilford Delta. Three two thousand and shoot F time all the time. Yeah, at F eight. Yeah, F eight. <laughs> exactly. Oh, no. Maybe that's the way. <laughs> it. Yeah, I don't see how else I'm going to be able to take her her photos, but I do want to show her 
film and I hope that she gets into photography too. And I'm, I am glad that, you know, film photography is, is becoming so popular because for a long time I felt like, you know, film stocks were in trouble, film cameras were in trouble and dark rooms were closing down and it was hard to get your film developed. And now it's becoming like more common, you know, labs are back to being in business and have a lot of work for them even, you know? And so it's cool. It's cool to see. I feel like film photography, it, it's so different from digital photography. It really makes you slow down and think about your photos more. You know, you're not just taking a bunch of photos and hoping one of them comes out. You know, it's, mm. it's more calculated. It's more, you know, there's more purpose behind each photo that you take. And so I feel like, you know, kind of going back to like Japanese culture and stuff, it, you know, like that appreciation for each photograph, you know, like, yeah it it definitely you know you you have it more when you shoot film so yeah and talking about uh, photos erica we we're close to the last part of this interview and this part is called uh, una foto una fresa i know that you speak spanish so Mm -hmm. but in in english is one one photo one phrase for all uh all the non-spanish speakers in the audience so (laughs) I will show you one one image that you send me. Okay. So if you can share some thoughts about it, um, maybe another crazy story like uh, this one with the lake or the roller plate, I don't know. <laughs> But if you can share something else with this. Yeah, of course. Fine. Okay. So let me show you the first, the first photo is this one. Did you see it? Mm, yes. What, what you can tell about it? This photo, so what's so interesting about this photo is um, I really just loved the framing of the trees with yeah. the building. Um, that was actually why I wanted to take the photo. The bird did not exist in the photo. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I brought my camera up to my face. I went to go take it. I knew I was shooting black and white, so I knew the contrast would be really cool with the sky and the and the branches and stuff. It was winter, uh, so it was very cool. That's why there's no leaves on the trees either. Mm. And that's actually the oldest building in Seattle too, that one right there, the white one. Um, Okay. Yeah, so it's like the oldest, um, how do you say, like a, like a, um, like a, what what do you call them? Sure. Anyway, the old like a skyscraper, like the oldest oh, okay. skyscraper. skyscraper. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was like, I can't think sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think in English. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's it's the biggest skyscraper, and um, you know, I just I just love the look of it. it has a very timeless yeah. kind of look to it. So anyway, I went to go take this photo, and then I went to focus, and then I saw the bird come, and I just took it. You know, I just took the photo. I didn't see the bird actually go right where it was and so i just took the photo and i was like okay cool um i knew that the bird would come out in it i just didn't know where or how maybe it could have been like flying in a way where it didn't have its wings expanded you know Mm -hmm. so i just feel like this photo if it teaches me anything it's like sometimes you just when you take a photo that you originally intended, sometimes it turns out a lot better than you thought. Yeah. And it could be because it could be because something within a split second changes like this one. And then you capture something totally unique and totally interesting. And so I remember when I developed this role and I saw this frame, I was like, wow, what are the chances <laughs> of that bird being directly lined up with the building and having the wing span out and just being able to fully see it's it's a bird you know um so i just thought that that was so cool and it's actually one of it's like one of my favorite black and white photos that i've taken um my mom actually printed it and put it in her house she's a proud oh, mom nice. that's great <laughs> that's right but yeah she does have a print of this one in in her house um because she also really liked it but yeah this was one of those where it's like Yeah, just that's why I say just take photos of anything and everything because you just never you just never know. Sometimes the photo turns out better than you than you even originally thought it would. Amazing. This is the next one. <laughs> oh. 
I remember this one. <laughs> <laughs> so this one is not film, it's digital. Um, I was taking photos in Japan um, when I was there with my with my work. I was actually there on like a trip with my with my work. We were like hosting a a trip in Japan, and I was along for the ride because I had lived there and I could help. It was our first trip in Japan, so I was able to help with you know mm -hmm. um, location and very minimal translation and stuff like that. <laughs> so we were walking around and I saw this guy and he was on the phone and I just, I just loved it. I just saw it. It just felt like a scene out of a movie to me or something. Um, and I just saw him there and the light that was, you know, shining down on him and just like how he stood out. It just looked like he was like a character in a movie or like a video game or something, you know, like, <laughs> you know, with a little light that has like a little quest on him or something, you know? So <laughs> it was just, super cool yeah. like i i just i just saw it you know i just saw the whole scene for what it was and yeah i just i just took it i actually took a closer one yeah of him i got kind of brave for this one because I, I was shooting it with a 23 millimeter so which was is a 30 is a 35 full frame equivalent yeah um so you know i had to get pretty close but one thing i will say about japan is like again they're so respectful that and like people take a lot of photos there anyway and i think they're used to the tourism but like they usually don't react that bad to someone if like they know they're being taken a photo of usually they'll just kind of just you know try to get out of your your way or your photo or like cover their face but like i guess he was so deep in conversation he just didn't even really realize but i i had to go in for a closer for a closer <laughs> portrait and you got a bribe you got a bribe he didn't yeah he didn't seem to mind so and I just love how like both photos, even though they are the same person, same place, they kind of tell different stories. Yeah, right? totally. Um, so yeah. Yeah, exactly. His his pose in the close up is another reason why I really, really loved it. Like leaning against the t the the wall there. So <laughs> yeah. This is the yeah. next one. <laughs> So this one I took, this is um, at our office, my job's office. I work for Moment. Um, and this is at our Seattle office. This is one of my coworkers, Josh, and really good friend, really great friend. Um, we were taking some photos. Um, I, I got sent some film from Kodak um, as like a gift to shoot and to share and stuff. And um I decided to, you know, we had like this big, the, the blue backdrop is like on mm -hmm. a pair of wheels. It's like a wooden wall that we basically painted and we paint different colors sometimes. Um, but Josh, you know, um, offered to be a model for me. And I just was like, what can I have him do? I want to have him do something kind of different. And he's a huge plant lover. He has a lot okay. of plants. Yeah, he has a lot of plants. Um, and so I was just like, I, I kind of want you doing something, you know, almost like you're not thinking about it. Like it's like, you don't really, like you're not focused on it, you know, just very nonchalantly, you know? So I put the pot there and I got this water vase and I was like, okay, I want you to water this plant. Like you're not really even thinking about it. Um, so this was kind of like my way to photograph him and something that kind of defined him to me or like something that I knew that resonated with him. Um, but display it in a way that, you know, maybe somebody looking at this photo, they don't know that. They don't know that he's a plant person, but it just, his pose and like his almost like carelessness with watering the plant it i don't know it kind of draws you in and like kind of makes you feel like what's what's really going on here like why is he just <laughs> watering a plant you know but yeah i thought it was like a cool i don't know i kind of like to have people do different things when i take their photos sometimes i just like taking a portrait of somebody just because of how they look or who they are but um sometimes i like setting up a a shot too and this was one of those instances where i did it's very rare that i get to do that because i mostly shoot street photography so i when i do shoot portraits i try to make it at least a little bit interesting <laughs> exactly 
Yeah, transform um, that into a scene, into an a, an action. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. And the last, exactly. the last two are these that are also a portrait with it, with another concept, right? Yes. So this one was actually um, in Japan. Um, this was for my friend um, who is Canadian. She met her husband in Japan. We went to school together in Japan. We went to a language school together in Japan. And she was, they were, they got engaged and then they wanted me to shoot their wedding. And I was very honored. Um, and so we were staying at this really beautiful little house called the Moshi Moshi house, which was, it literally is like a telephone house. It was like out in the countryside in Japan. And it was an old um, like telephone house, which basically was like the only telephone in the little town in the, in the wow. mountains that people would go to, to make phone calls if they had to kind of thing. Um, but they converted it into a ryokan, which is like, you know, like a Japanese, um, kind of like a, like almost like a bread and a bed and breakfast kind of thing. Um, oh, yeah. but without like the breakfast part, it's just like a, like a stay, like a stay, uh, like a hotel or Airbnb kind of thing. And, um, So we got to stay there and she wanted to take some, some photos, um, some like intimate photos for her wedding and like boudoir style, you know, and we did, and it was a lot of fun, but there were, I also wanted to kind of take some photos that, you know, weren't the typical style and kind of gave a little bit more mystery and, and, you know, kind of were more artistic, I guess, you know, Um, this one was un unintentional. I didn't mean for it to be cut off there. Obviously, it was like the first of the frame, but I just love how it turned out. And, you know, with the Japanese culture, the boudoir like style was already kind of like, ooh, I don't know, you know, like her husband, you know, obviously. So we wanted to make sure to make it very tasteful. So as you can see, like, it's just like showing back, showing bone, showing shoulders, just showing skin, but not not the typical boudoir shots that you would normally see where it's more sexualized and more, you know, which there's nothing wrong with that, but, you know, obviously being from Japan and with this culture yeah. and a respect and an homage to the culture, you know, we wanted to keep it very, very simple, very elegant, you know? So, um, but yeah, these two shots, I love how they turned out. The other one was, you know, just some inspiration that I had gotten just like, she's very tall. She's very model esque. She does model now. And I always wanted her to model and, and we just kind of had fun. She had a beautiful kimono and I, and I just loved like the lighting in this, in this, it all came from that shoji, they call it that um, paper kind of door that you see there. Yeah. That yeah. paper window. So all of that natural light just was coming from that shoji, which kind of, acted as like a natural soft box, you know, yeah. kind of like a diffuser. So it was really cool. And we just, yeah, we just had, we just had some fun with it. So those were just some concepts that I came up with on the spot. Um, sometimes it just takes looking around and using what you have available to you, you know, and just trying to come up with, with an interesting image. Like what I did with the last one too, with, you know, we had a plant pot, we had the watering can, you know, a cool chair so i just was like oh this would be kind of cool so just just kind of seeing whatever you have around you and just trying to make something out of it sometimes can be a fun challenge you know yeah it is it, it's forced you to be in the moment because you have to to uh i don't know like being conscious of what is happening where the light is coming from and what can you do with the things you have on hand to mm -hmm. get the most of that situation. Yeah. Exactly. It, it is a little bit more difficult with film because with film, usually you, you don't feel that, uh, I don't know. Um, how can I say it? that, that, la, la confianza, you, you, that confident to, to improvise. Okay. That's true, because, especially with expensive films. Yeah, <laughs> because it's expensive film because you only have, depending on the camera, a certain number of frames, so you don't improvise that much. But That's so true. There, there, there are a very, a very good surprises, like 
some of the photos uh, you've to, you you've taken and 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 came out really great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's funny you say that because I have like two rolls of Fuji Natra 1600 mm -hmm. and I refuse to just shoot them because I'm not like you said like I don't have like you know, I want to have a concept. I want to have a purpose yeah. to shoot it. You know, because you know, first of all, I know what it looks like and I would want something that would amplify or really accentuate the, the film and the look of the film, you know? So I, I, I just don't want to shoot just anything. So I'm very, yeah. you know, I'm kind of saving it for a special, special time. Um, but then it's hard because it's like the film is just, yeah, you know, getting, getting older. older. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> It's tricky. So I, I want to, I want to do it soon. <laughs> For sure. Well, Erica, this was the last part of the interview. So thank you very much for, for having a, a little time on Sunday, Sunday morning yeah. for us, and we really appreciate it. Um, you are Alex, mm -hmm. an, an excellent photographer. You have a, a excellent eye, un buen ojo, diríamos. So <laughs> thank, um, you. thank you very much. Thank you very much yeah, for this. Of course. And, Yeah, thank and you for your time. Thing. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and, and those crazy stories about your cameras. Yeah. I know. I'm just uh, going to be, be the crazy, crazy camera story lady is how. <laughs> <laughs> be proud of those stories. I am. I, yeah. I, I definitely am. And, and I Don't think. Don't be ashamed. I embrace the thing embrace that makes lucky. me most. Yeah. Embrace so the I luck. Think, yeah. I think the thing that makes me most, you know, proud of it is, is the fact that I, I, I do shoot them, you know, and, and. Yeah, of you know, course. if you have all those cameras, shoot them. You know, don't let them just collect dust. You yeah. know, unless like they are just for you know they don't work and you just have them just to have them. But you know, if you have a camera, shoot it. And if you don't, then especially now with photography becoming so popular, film photography, then you know, give it or sell it to somebody who yeah who will you let know, let other pass people... on the love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, awesome. well, well, this has been great. It's been great to meet you guys. I actually have, so I'm actually in the middle of cooking. Thank you. So thank my you. house smells amazing. I'm cooking ropa vieja. So <laughs> now I'm <Yeah>. hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, but yeah, it was it was awesome getting to talk to you guys, and hopefully we'll we'll be able to stay in touch and catch up every once in a while. So yeah, thank you. Thank you of everybody. course, thank you again, and have a have a great Sunday, and take care. Yeah. Awesome. We will share Bye, with you this link of this. Interview. Oh, perfect. Yes, I would love to share. <laughs> Thank you, Erika. Have a great day. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.